Okay, this video is, is there any hope for memory loss, dementia, cognitive decline patients? And you know, when a viewer asked me this question, and I, I really like the viewer questions because they motivate me to think about things. And so let's talk about it. Basically, the brain can recover and the brain can improve, but it happens slowly. And the sooner a person starts improving their brain, the better off they will be. Because when somebody presents with full-blown dementia, let's say at 70 years old, they've been working towards that typically for about 30 years or more. So the smart move is get your act together for health as soon as you can. Definitely you want to get your act together by your 30s because then you'll have a much better long-term prognosis. You know, for example, look at myself. I'm 60 years old. I have zero medical problems. I'm totally healthy. I'm aging better than everyone I know my age. Okay, all the doctors my age, I'm aging better than all of them. Okay, and all my family members. Okay, so it's like finally after 20 years, they're like, oh, gee, you might be right about that diet. It's like, yeah, no shit. So anyways, the reason I'm telling you this is I was fat. When I, I went through a fat phase in my early 30s and I recovered from it, okay? And people can do that. They can recover from a lot of things, but the sooner you start, the better. Okay, now how do we know the brain can recover? Oh, but, but on the other hand, once a person's 70 years old, they've got complete dementia, they don't know what day it is, they don't know what, where they are, they don't remember anybody in their family's name. Um, I've never seen somebody who's gotten to that point recover back to normal, okay? Um, there are some other causes of dementia where a person can make a complete recovery, but they're rare. Things like communicating hydrocephalus, for example, um, and, and there's other biochemical stuff. All that stuff's really rare, so we're not going to talk about that right now. Okay, what I want to do is just talk about what improves a brain. For example, you have a blood-brain barrier that keeps out bad things. So these are the endothelial cells. They're part of the blood-brain barrier. Again, it's a single layer of cells thick. There's some supporting cells. Astrocytes will have a foot process and whatnot down to it. Okay, there's pericytes, but the bottom line is endothelial cells together with the TJs, TJs are tight junctions, make up your blood-brain barrier. Okay, so your blood-brain barrier tight junctions, they use butyrate, which comes from dietary fiber, to make these tight junctions. So if you eat the plant-based diet with a lot of dietary fiber, you'll be better at making your tight junctions. If you don't have a good blood-brain barrier, then chemicals from the blood can get into the brain tissue, the brain parenchyma, and they can cause you know, foggy thinking, brain fog, fish fog. <laughs> there was a name for fish fog because the, the mercury in fish can also cause impaired thinking. So you want to avoid those toxins, okay? But the bottom line is you eat your dietary fiber, you'll have a better blood-brain barrier. All right, the next thing is myelin. Myelin is a fatty coating of the neurons. And um, when a neuron is used, the brain makes more myelin. So basically, the brain is a use-it-or-lose-it uh, type of setup. And it's because neuronal resources are, they're limited. So the brain does not want to increase. When you add myelin to the nerve axon, the conducting component of it between the cell body and the synaptic terminal, it can conduct faster. It can send a message faster. So the more you use a neuron, the more myelin the brain puts on that neuron to speed it up. And so if you don't use a neuron, like you neglect, uh, let's say you learned Spanish in college and you were pretty good with it, but you don't ever practice your Spanish, you'll gradually have less and less myelination of those neurons, okay? If you start studying your Spanish again and practicing it again, it'll come back to you pretty fast. I've had that experience where I hadn't practiced Spanish in years, and then I started talking to somebody. Actually, I was talking to that Gustavo guy, and I liked him, and it was nice, and I had fun, and he could understand me, but I think he got a little nervous. I make him nervous. I make a lot of people in the plant world nervous, you know, because I talk about, you know, all the problems with processed foods and other things, and I criticize popular commercial foods, so they freak out. So he kind of freaked out. He didn't call me back. But anyways, he was nice, and I liked him, and my Spanish came back real fast. I could have a total conversation with him in Spanish um, and understand everything he said. Okay, anyways, um, so you got to use it or lose it. Use it and you maintain good myelin on the nerves you want to use. And if you don't do something, you know what it's like for many years, you lose it. Okay, what else is next? BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic growth factor. Basically, when you exercise, when you study a topic and learn, have intellectual conversations, you produce more BDNF and that will help the neurons to grow and be maintained. You can also get synaptogenesis, formation of new connections between neurons. So just this little bar part here, the synaptic bulb, Bhutan, joining with the dendrites of this neuron, that is synaptogenesis, forming a new neuron connection. That happens all day long every day in the human brain. Then there's something even bigger than that called neurogenesis. Neurogenesis right here, formation of an entire neuron, that happens in smaller amounts every day. 
And the more healthy are your habits, your good diet, your getting your sleep, managing your stress, the more neurons you're, and the more you're learning, the more neurogenesis you're capable of forming. BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic growth factor, increases neurogenesis. So again, comes from good things. Get your exercise, manage your stress, get your sleep, try to be learning something every day. Try to have at least one friend you can have an intellectual conversation with. And you know, you can have, you can be friends with, um, you know, friends with your books, okay? They're, you're learning from them. You'll you'll get some BDNF from that. The next thing is angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels. And when you use the brain, you'll form new blood vessels in the area that's more active. That's called angiogenesis. Genesis is to form new. Angio is blood vessels, so angiogenesis, little capillary drawn here. Okay, so the point of this is, you know, I look at brain MRIs all the time. And there's a sequence called SWI, Susceptibility Weighted Imaging. And I can see the blood vessels on the brain quite clearly. And the general trend is, as people get older, they have less and less blood vessels on their brain. Their brain's becoming slowly devascularized. But I can tell you, I see some old people, 80 years old, and they've got a normal-looking brain um, vascularity, just like a 40-year-old. Okay, So it doesn't have to happen. Does it usually happen? Yeah, the average American's fat, sick, and stupid by the time they're 60. Okay, but it doesn't have to be that way. They all got the same problems. You know, they're they're fat, hypertensive, diabetic, with atherosclerosis plugging up their arteries. Okay. All right. Uh, what else here? These are mitochondria here, and you can form new mitochondria again. It's a use it or lose it thing, kind of like the myelin formation. Basically, the more you use the neuron, the more mitochondria it produces, so it can maintain a higher level of activity. Okay, and every medical student notices something like this, and they study their butts off their freshman year. They notice that the first, you know, the first week or month of school, it's hard to study more than three, four hours at a time. But you know, by the middle of the first year, they can easily study seven or eight hours. They just got a lot more brain endurance. So to form new mitochondria is called mitochondrial biogenesis. Mitochondrial biogenesis. In addition, the astrocytes can store some glycogen, stored carbohydrate to provide more energy to the neurons. The, the astrocyte, the green cell here, is, is called the mama cell. So here's the presynaptic neuron, postsynaptic neuron. Messages are sent across the synaptic cleft here, and it's called a tripartite synapse. So the presynaptic, postsynaptic neurons, and then the adjacent astrocyte, uh, which is the mama cell. It helps the neurons make this thing work well. And again, it can store glycogen, sometimes called glycogen supercompensation. And that's increased by exercise in particular. Because they did these studies, some of them, in, you know, obviously in rodents, and um, they were able to show increased glycogen in the adjacent astrocytes. The next thing is the concept of microglia activation. Microglia are the immune cells of the brain. They're really a type of macrophage. And the point I'm making is uh, bad things can activate the microglia in a, in a negative way and make them cause inflammation in the brain. You don't want that. So what, what will do that? Uh, head trauma will do that. So you want to avoid head trauma. You know, don't be doing stupid stuff like, you know, hitting a soccer ball with your head like a moron. Um, if you want to do one of those martial arts type sports, do something where it's like wrestling or something or, you know, hop keto or something. Don't be doing things where you're, 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 you're getting punched in the head. That makes you stupid. Okay. Head trauma makes you stupid. Um, what else? Uh, manage your stress. Okay, so avoid unnecessary stress. Get your sleep because you know lo losing sleep, sleep deprivation does the same thing. Avoid caffeine. Caffeine elevates the same hormones, uh, cortisol and catecholamines. All right, a psychological stress and sleep deprivation. So you want to avoid that. Basically, do all the good things, avoid the bad things. Okay, and you'll have less microglia activation. Religion helps people because it gives them a sense of purpose and meaning in their life, and that makes them happier and lowers their stress. And so that will help to prevent microglia activation and give you a better chance to reverse microglia activation. Okay, so that's some of the pictorial stuff. Now I'm going to go into a little more like didactic stuff on how do you protect neurons. Oh, one thing I want to do too, though, I want to go over this concept right here, the concept of penumbra. The word penumbra means twilight. And it arrives, and it also means brain that could be saved, brain that's non-functional, but it could be saved. So let's say the patient has a stroke. So a stroke means you plug up an artery and you get dead brain. All right, so the infarct core, also called the necrotic core, this little black circle here, this is dead brain. The gray circle around it is what's called the penumbra, the twilight. All right, and the point of the penumbra is that this brain tissue is dysfunctional. It's not working well because it has a lack of blood supply. But if the blood supply could be restored, these neurons in the gray circle could be returned to normal. And so 
I think that people have a lot of penumbra all over their brain from neurons that are functioning poorly because they've either got poor oxygen delivery, poor glucose delivery, um, and they're being exposed to toxins. It's very similar to the concept in the heart of stunned myocardium or hibernating myocardium, meaning cardiac muscle tissue that's not dead and could be saved, but it's currently not functioning well. So when you optimize all your brain habits, you could restore penumbra-like brain tissue, and that's one of the things you want to do. Okay, so is there any hope for memory loss and dementia? So we talked about neurogenesis, forming new neurons, and how exercise, learning, intellectual conversation will do that. Synaptogenesis, forming new synapses. Uh, you can teach an old dog a new trick. A lot of people learn new things when they're old if they make the effort. Um, angiogenesis, forming new blood vessels. We talked about that so you don't get a devascularized brain like most old Westerners. Mitochondrial biogenesis, making new mitochondria. Exercise is really good for the brain. You want to exercise. Get your sleep so you avoid uh, the stress problems. We talked about that. Glycogen storage and astrocytes, again, from exercise. Use it or lose it. We talked about the concept of brain fog. Well, when you maintain the blood-brain barrier, you get less brain fog. When you avoid toxins like the mercury and fish, you get less brain fog, better brain function, okay? We talked about restoring the penumbra with the good habits. We talked about how most Americans are fat, sick, and stupid. By stupid, I mean cognitively slow. They've lost the nuance. They've lost the spontaneity. They've lost that look of vitality in their face. Actually, meat eaters and processed food eaters, by the time they get in their 50s, they kind of look like their skin has this pale look, almost a little cadaver-like. They don't have good blood supply to their skin. They've lost that glow of vitality, okay? So you don't want to do that, okay? Your skin will perk up and look better if you have good blood flow to your skin. And that comes low-fat, low-sodium, vegan diet, whole food vegan diet, avoiding oils, okay? And I, I've given lots of lectures about brain toxins, mitochondrial inhibitors, circa inhibitors, excital toxins, and all this stuff. There's about 100 of them and they decrease brain function. So the smart move is watch those videos and avoid them. So anyways, yes, there is tremendous hope that a person can improve their brain, but they better start sooner rather than later because the more brain tissue is destroyed, the harder it is to recover function. And once a person is end stage and you know they're not orientated to person, place, and time, um, you know, I don't see those come back from the standard causes of dementia. Um, there are some rare things that a person can reverse 100%. You know, you could reverse 100% if the problem, well, close to 100% if the problem is just, you know, communicating hydrocephalus, you need a ventricular peritoneal shunt, okay? If you're hypothyroid, you restore your thyroid function, that can restore. You know, if you've got Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, thiamine deficiency, give thiamine, the patient can dramatically improve, okay? And so the good news is there are a lot of things you can do to improve the brain, but it improves slowly. So the smart move is to prevent stuff and to get started early. The earlier, the better. So hope this was helpful.